and it started. Welcome to the Long Game, a podcast in a place where effort, energy, and commitment matter. Today's guest is a, both a friend and a colleague, someone who has been in, in higher education at, at multiple universities and has repeatedly proven her leadership, her contributions, and, and visionary attributes that many aspire to. Sharon Pitt, Vice President of IT and Chief Information Officer at University of Delaware. Sharon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. So to start, just like any conversation, especially to those who will be watching or listening this later who happen to not know you or me, mm -hmm. um, could you start with a brief introduction, share a bit about your background, your experiences, and then kind of go into what are your major priorities that you and your teams are spending your time on today? Right, so you, you've done the introduction of, of the current role and the current university and the, the current title. Uh, I am coming up on 30 years in uh, higher education. I'm not gonna tell you exactly how far I am from, from 30, maybe, maybe on the lower part, maybe on the upper part, uh, but certainly uh, a, a lot of time in with higher education IT. Uh, I've been a CIO at two universities. As you've mentioned, I've worked at uh, multiple institutions, mostly in the uh, mid-Atlantic area, but with a stint up in uh, upstate uh, New York. Uh, and I think I'm a bit unusual as a CIO in that I spent a great deal of my professional career in the academic technology uh, side of uh, what is uh, being a, a CIO at a, at a in a higher education setting. So um, currently at the University of, of Delaware, uh, there are a lot of priorities, priorities for the institution. Of course, um, IT being very much a service organization, uh, helping the university, our, our priorities are often very much in alignment with the university, which is of course um, the safety of our students and, and our, uh, our, our teams who are uh, both uh, working remotely and learning remotely and also in some cases um, on campus or on, on campuses. Uh, and uh, certainly at the University of Delaware, we had some, um, I'm gonna call it uh, spires of excellence uh, in uh, online learning uh, at the institution, but not really a, a cohesive full-fledged online learning capability. So that is something that we are building and as a priority for the institution. And I would say um, uh, much like uh, many of us, uh, cost containment is something that we're deeply concerned about as the, the pandemic rages through our institutions and the uh, higher education industry as a whole. And we're looking at ways that we um, might be able to generate revenue. Uh, certainly the news is challenging and uh, uh, very much hopeful that, that, that vaccines and safety protocols and procedures will uh, help us to weather that uh, and come out a, a healthy and vibrant institution on the other end of the pandemic. Uh, for me personally, as a, a leader, uh, a, a priority for me is making sure that I'm communicating as much as possible. Uh, we're in a very different um, environment than we've been in as leaders in, in higher ed, where we could wander around from place to place. I mean, a, 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 a university campus is a very interesting place where you can actually get up and walk around and talk to people. And you do that in your office, but you walk from building to building, you see people, you know, when you're, when you're out to, to lunch, and there's a lot that you can get done without really being uh, planful about it. So <laughs> trying to figure out how you do that more effectively is something that, um, that, that has to be um, intentional and meaningful now. So that's uh, a priority of mine. I would say that, that our um, organizational priorities really haven't changed so much. We had a strategic plan. We're still working that strategic plan for uh, information technology and support of institutional uh, goals. Uh, it's just that in some cases, those activities have sped up. In some cases, those activities have slowed down. And then, of course, we had a whole bunch of items related to um, uh, COVID from uh, contact tracing to testing and 
uh, uh, creating space in, in uh, dining halls and all sorts of things associated with the response to COVID like all of us in higher education IT have been doing. Right, you are, I mean, 24 hours are clearly not enough. Uh, and, and there's there's so much going on on your campus. And uh, the comment you made earlier is, is, it's part of human nature. It's really interesting how much we miss that um, spontaneous approach and just walking out of the office and running into someone in the hallway and having a conversation for two, five, seven, 20 minutes about something that was not on your calendar yeah. that can spark different thoughts and ideas afterwards that now is, is a bit challenging. You really don't kind of call somebody on Zoom and random and hope that they're, they're in a room waiting for you to call them, right? <laughs> And that we we forget that. Um, you talked about a lot of of your opportunities, and you pointed out some of the you know kind of moments and, and facts of truth, if you will, as IT as a service organization, safety of students and teams, online learning. But what do you? And especially, I'm really interested in online learning, but in a new and creative way. And I know you as someone who's creative, and it generally doesn't prefer to follow. Uh, the herd, so to speak. What do you see as potential opportunities for higher education today or maybe years to come when it comes to some of these spaces, online learning or more flexible uh, modalities of delivering knowledge, content and testing that knowledge than we've done in the past? Because, you know, uploading a PDF that's not ADA compliant, not really an online experience that anybody wants to subscribe to. Yeah. It's um, it's interesting because having come out of the the academic technology space, I'm really um, I mean, uh, when I first started, I was coding HTML to uh, develop courses. This was before the first learning management system came out. Some people are now like, yeah, she's on the upper end of that thirty years of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're finally reaching the promise of what that can be. Right, so um, we've got people who didn't think that they could do online learning who are suddenly doing online learning and preferring to do online learning. I mean, you're seeing this in the, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the, the, the fights of institutions of, of some saying, faculty absolutely have to come in and teach and faculty are saying, no, I want to teach online. Such a flip from you know eight months ago where, where um, uh, I would say at the University of Delaware, we actually had in the faculty bylaws that faculty would only be uh, only teach a certain number of online classes, and and that had to, that the handbook had to be changed in order for um, for faculty to be able to teach in the online environment. And I think that's really the preference uh, for faculty right now. So so now you have this very shifted culture. Uh, of, uh, of an openness to doing something that, uh, that that culture had not necessarily been, I would say, um, in the very broad sense, open to online learning. So, you know, now you've got that, which is something that you've not necessarily had in the past, depending on what institution you, you've been at. And uh, you've got a, a bevy of tools that are available to you to accomplish that. But I would say that the thing that I've been um, most pleased with seeing, and I think this is the harder work, is faculty really rethinking these courses, really taking advantage of instructional design, um, not the rote um, testing environment, but looking at alternative forms of assessment to understand if, if learning is actually happening or, or not happening. And I think this is uh, the, real, the real promise, the, the kinds of analytics that you can bring to this, the, the kinds of um, um, learning spaces that can happen depending on what the curriculum uh, uh, is. Uh, the, the higher number of um, instructional design professionals that are out there to help faculty think through these, these possibilities. And then just having sort of that, that core capability on campus of faculty who can really talk about this with each other, which is not, again, not something that we've necessarily had in the past where we only have like a small percentage of faculty that are doing that. But these become broader conversations where you can create more innovative responses and, and opportunities. 
and it, it's a really, um, uh, it's a support intensive activity for um, uh, the, the staff who are in our uh, instructional design uh, spaces. Uh, but I think we're going to really start pushing the, the boundaries of what technology does now and we'll need um, uh, to agilely develop uh, opportunities and tools within our own environment. But, you know, I think we're going to be looking to the vendor space for more and more uh, agile tools to respond to all the many things that, that faculty might be doing. I mean, at University of Delaware, we have, you know, dance programs and music programs and our conservation programs and our history programs, you know, that th these are not um, challenging, th these are very challenging uh, curriculum areas to place in an online environment, but we've seen faculty really step up and do this in, in, uh, in very interesting ways. So, um, I'm sorry, I could go on and on about that. So I'll just- No, 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 I, I appreciate that because every time, every time I hear you speak, um, I learn something new. So I'm also taking notes, not just um, for the episode, but for myself to, to explore and look at from, from my university's perspective. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is that handbook change, right? We know historically the laws, well, well, actually most things are behind the speed of progression of technology. Right. Right? I remember when I used to work in, in New Jersey at a different university uh, many years ago where I could not provision um, a particular storage solution with a major vendor because at that time, they could not guarantee the data would sit in continental United States. Mm -hmm. And therefore, due to, due to a law that was written in 1967, right. I was not able to proceed. Right. right? Yeah. So, But going back to the handbook change um, and, and shift in culture. Have you started noticing, because initially it's necessity and safety, right? right? At some point it was a right. saber tooth tiger. Now it's the pandemic, right? There's always going to be something that's threatening us in one way, shape or form. How we respond to it matters and how we learn from that going forward matters even more. Have you noticed the shift in the culture of your university of going from necessity and safety to there are actually opportunities that we can explore this further and maybe hopefully retain some aspects of it for years to come. Right. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know that they've, we, that we've yet gotten to that transform stage. Um, I think we're still a bit more in that operational reactive space, but uh, in part because I don't know about your team, my team is exhausted. So, you know, we, we've sort of, um, you know, we went from that massive pivot in, in March to doing things online. And then that's the demand, 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 demand for, for information. Uh, and, and there hasn't been a break for anyone in IT. And, and I, I, you know, I don't want to say this in a complainy way because there are many other very important frontline workers, health workers who are, who are doing way more important things than, than um, IT staff who, who yeah, I get to sit in my, my home office and, and, and mostly work. But this is a team that's in service to the rest of the institution and they are very, very tired. So, uh, you know, I, I've said, I said this at a, at a board meeting uh, yesterday I've said it to leadership at the institution because we're really in the place where we need to have conversations about what do organizational structures look like? What does our workspace look like? What does the workforce look like? Uh, how is it that we need to change? But it's going to be very, very hard to get to a place of um, innovation if we can't rest and reflect and re-energize. And those things really need to happen before we can get to that, that transformational uh, state. And, you know, I'm just getting to the point where I'm thinking, you know, I'm sure it's going to be July-ish before the bulk of my team starts uh, coming back uh, to uh, our campus. Uh, we have a directive that anybody can, who can work remotely needs to work remotely. Um, so that's what we've been doing, and we've been able to do that quite effectively, and people have been taking advantage of things like Teams and Zoom and Slack and other kinds of tools to make sure that they're in communication with each other. That's sort of the, the here and now innovation. 
the innovation that we really need to be getting to is, okay, what's this gonna look like? Because like pre-COVID, my team was wanting to work from home a bit more now, you know, they, I don't think they wanted to work from home this much, <laughs> but um, I would say, I, I don't think that there's a leader at the University of, of Delaware that that um, doesn't understand that that the IT team can be incredibly effective working from home. I would say just um, the, the speed with which uh, we've uh, produced, and, and part of that is the adrenaline of just being needing to be in that response situation, but the speed with which we've produced is incredible. And I think that, that we will have uh, every imaginable authority to be as remote as we, we want to be. The instructional designers that we've recruited, um, several of them work uh, remotely and they will never uh, move from where they live uh, now to, to be at the University uh, of Delaware physically. Uh, I've got folks in every time zone in the United States, I have them already but it was sort of dotted, you know, here and there. And, and folks who had been with us that then, because of a personal situation or a spouse moving or, or something, um, we managed to retain them as, an, as employees, but they had sort of physically started with us. You know, now um, you know, we need to figure out ways that um, we're onboarding people. and, and and you know, even for those people who are close to us who will eventually come and physically work to campus, how we onboard them is a, a very different way from how we've done that in the past. And we had a pretty intensive buddy system and get to know the area and that sort of thing. Um, uh, different groups, I think, have dealt with this in, in different, different ways. I, I would say all in all, uh, you know, our cultures were sort of there when this when this started, and uh, the pandemic has a way of um, uh, putting in high relief your your opportunities and your challenges. Uh, so you, your your opportunities are are that much more interesting, and your challenges are that much more difficult. And you know, we had a a family oriented. Um, I uh, can do spirit within the within the organization we had. Uh, we're a very service oriented organization. We're an innovative organization. All of that has come out. We had been um, working very hard at building a, a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. And I would say that 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 the pandemic tried to cut that off at our knees uh, because it 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 is events like this that I think hits. The, the people who are, are most challenged in, in, uh, in diversity and, and in terms of us having inclusion, uh, it, it makes it very hard. And so we have to work that much harder to make sure that, that we make that a part of our, our, our culture. But you know, it's sort of in, in fits and starts across the, the institution. You kind of know who you are as an organization and who you are as an institution. Uh, but but we're all not we're all not working in lockstep there, so um, uh, it, it it's been very uh, I, I would say the most gratifying thing has been to see how people are really reaching out to each other and trying to make sure that you're okay everything's okay and what is it that we need to do to to move forward for the most part. Grace I'm, matters. I'm not sure whether that answered your, your no, question. No, it absolutely, it absolutely did. One of the comments you said, you know, I don't know about you, but my, you know, my team is exhausted. And I was going to say both of my teams are exhausted because my previous university was the first five months, March, March through eight, through July, the first five months, and then August through now at, at another place. And you see it from both ends, kind of front and hopefully back half. Right. One can hope, right? right. Um, and it never stops. And no. folks have had no opportunities to take time off. And even if you can take time off, time off, you can't go anywhere. You can't travel. You can't go to places. You can't go to that European vacation that you were going to do. So one of the things that we have done um, is allow people to carry over vacation a lot more than usual into the next year, into 2021. And we're just saying like, hey, we, we have to do this. You can't we've just... Done we've done the same. Right. Can't penalize people. And you already started answering my, my next question to a degree is... What do you think we can learn from this? And I don't mean just um, a university or two right. or higher ed as a whole. 
Yeah. But but you know, nation, the world, humanity. Yeah. What do you think we can learn from this when it comes to the future of work and future of life? Yeah. Right? One of the questions I always challenge, and I when I talk to my friends, um, um, we laugh about it. I go, where was I when we voted this five days work and two days off? Like I would have voted against it. Four right? to three, three to four. Right. Why can't we do five? I'll start with four to three. Make right. them longer. Well, they're longer hours anyway. Make them longer. I'll put in the 40 hours or 50 or whatever. That would look, you know, like half a day in, on some weeks, four days a week. We can have different people stagger. You, your team is still responsive seven days a week if needed, but yeah. you don't have to show up four. I mean, you don't have to show up five. Yeah. You can show up four. I actually did that this summer in an effort to, uh, be, because we have um, a, a telework policy at the institution that allows us to be a lot more flexible in what we do. And I was just seeing the team just beat up. And, and it was interesting because I, I raised the issue with, a, with the team and, you know, I ended up letting each unit do it the way that they wanted to do it because they 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 knew their um, service constituency. So like one group didn't want to take off on Fridays because that's the day the group that they served most asked them questions because the 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 group that they served was mostly heads down working Monday through Thursday. So they wanted to take Mondays off instead of Fridays. And you know you worked longer hours in, in order to to do this, and then um, of my my academic technology group, who of course is you know they're incredibly creative. Their supervisor worked through a schedule for each employee where every person got a four day weekend through the summer. So they got <laughs> a Friday and and a Monday. So so different groups handled it in in different ways, and some decided that they didn't want to do it at, at all. Uh, so I think that that kind of flexibility is going to be incredibly important to us. I'll, I'll tell you the thing that I'm struggling with is um, I like to go uh, into work. I like to be around the team. I, I like to, to walk around. Um, I have like, two offices on, on campus, so but walking around is a, a little bit uh, challenging because sometimes I'm in one place and sometimes I'm in another place. But um, my home was my sanctuary. It was it was the place where I could get away from. Well, that's not happening anymore. You know, work is like, you know, 100% from my home location. So I'm very much struggling with um, how is it that I separate uh, that uh, work from from home so that I get that energy and I you know I don't look at a place in my house and think of it as you know oh god I have to go in there and work for you know nine or ten or twelve hours depending on what it is that's going on that day. That's that's a real challenge. I, I think that um and it, i know you're you're gonna ask a, a question at some point about um what question would you ask other people so I'll ask that now which is sure. um, uh, how are you doing that work-life balance when you're working from home? And it's almost a silly question because there are so many information technology professionals who do this every single day, the, the, the work from home group. But in higher education IT, higher education is such a place-based um, uh, culture um, we have buildings, lots yeah, of we them. have buildings, you have students, you have faculty, right. you know, everybody comes that, to that place, that physical community and coming to that place. And, and, you know, this is not how I functioned for decades. <laughs> and, and so, you know, all the people that I know who work for professional organizations are like, you silly duck, you know, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I remember I see, I have a uh, same thing on my office at home, um, the way it's set up it's as you're entering the house kind of right on the left and there's no doors there's this big open space so sometimes it's the, the angling of the camera and one of the things i heard someone mention in one of the cio calls i was on probably six months ago is that this gentleman was was working out of home at a small manhattan apartment and he would tape orange bright orange tape on the floor for the rest of his family to understand and say, hey, once daddy is on this side of the tape, daddy's working. Once he's on that side of the tape, we can play and do everything else. It's the last dustman from WKRP in Cincinnati. 
<laughs> right. And, and, and then what was really interesting is that the kids, after several weeks of that, came with their own terms and conditions and saying that he was, requi he was required to spend percentage of day on this side of the tape every so many hours and so forth. So that is a contract and agreement. Yes. Um, you just talked about empowering your team, right? right. In, in each of your units, each of your departments to be self-aware and make their own decisions based on the folks that they support and work mm -hmm. with, uh, which is one of many um, kind of revealing qualities of a leader. You know me a bit and those of you who know me know how passionate I am about leadership and innovation those two areas when it comes to um, uh, professional services. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on impact of leaders and leadership when it comes to organizational growth and change, right? Yeah. And I don't mean those in leadership positions, right. I mean leaders. Where well, have you seen some good examples and maybe what are some of the things that you yourself, in addition to things you've already shared, have done with your teams or across your university to enable and, and empower and support people and you know, make them aware that it's okay to fail, that it's okay to try some new things, that it's okay not to always get it right. Well, I think in some ways you kind of had to have that in place going into this, you know, whether it's pandemic or whether it's any other time. Uh, it, it, to me, it's that inclusive, inclusivity piece of what we call DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion that, that um, First of all, people need to, to see themselves as having a, a role and a space and a voice in the organization that, that, they're, that they're in and they, they need to have safety in um, uh, expressing their concerns. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a, um, you know, there, there's a cultural space that you walk into as a leader, but then there's a, there's a, um, culture that you can begin to, to create and, and mold within that um, environment that you walk into. Because some of those cultures are, are very valuable and important that you walk into and some of them are damaging and they need to be changed. And, and some of them need a little bit of tweaking in order for your organization to be more effective. So communication and transparency is something that's um, deeply important to me. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, we, we have daily stand-up meetings via Zoom. They schedule for 30 minutes. They sometimes last only two, but, you know, we share uh, information about what's happening uh, during the day. We put that into a Google Doc. We share it with the, the entire staff. Uh, we have, uh, we put the meetings of our senior staff uh, notes out to everyone in the organization. We've got, um, a fun committee, which, you know, I should never be on a fun committee. Uh, there, there, are, there are so many more people who are, are great at uh, and creative at doing fun. And, and I know that, you know, enough that I should not be the person who's doing the fun committee, but we have fun committees. Can I get the charge of that committee? Because that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, go forth and do interesting things that uh, that don't break um, organizational policy. <laughs> you know, but it really is about helping us come together as an organization. And part of that's being respectful of, of individuals within the organization because you know they're, they're not necessarily that many extroverts in, in the IT space. Uh, so how do introverts have fun and how do we bring them into the process? You know, how, how do we um, uh, recognize the things that happened before and, and do the, the fun things that, that uh, we'd like to do in terms of meetings, which we can't do and picnics, which we can't do. Uh, we've been uh, struggling with how it is that we do the, the holiday party. Uh, there's been a, a 40 year tradition of a munchie party the day before people go. And we're like, how are we gonna do the munchie party this year? Um, uh, we, since I've been here, we've had a gingerbread house competition and we're thinking, how do we do something like that? But then we can't come together as a group. So it'll have to be individual people doing uh, gingerbread. And, you know, it's, um, it seems almost, um, uh, yeah, I suppose some could view it as, as trait, but it's, it's really about how you come together as a, as a family, how it is that, that you, that you celebrate each other, that you, um, you celebrate a, as an organization, you recognize that you are people uh, in the organization. Uh, 
you you recognize the the good work that's been um, done, and I think that you know having that uh, voice, having those paths, uh, having that that safety is one where ideas can spawn and be be heard, uh, because I do believe very much so that that leadership happens on on multiple levels. And in some ways, uh, you know, I don't have to lead that. And, and in many ways, I don't want to be the person that's leading that because I am a leader. I am there. I've been doing it, you know, for, for years now. But part of my responsibility is uh, building the next generation of, of leaders within the organization and, frankly, the, the higher education field or even the IT field. Um, to who are, who are the next great people and and what kind of environment do you need in order to to spawn uh, innovation you know and it's not just about smart people which you know i got plenty of skilled smart you know experts on my team it's how do you not you know squash that beautiful little idea that comes up and you you, you know you say this that it's interesting and you know, I, you probably know me enough that I'm, I'm an exceptionally decisive person. So <laughs> I'm always having to sort of stop myself and, you know, uh, uh, hope that people are going to push back on me a, a, a little bit. And sometimes I'll even ask those, those questions. Um, what is it that I need to do? How's it going? You know, on, on days when I'm more um, open to feedback. <laughs> right. We have those days. <laughs> some, some days we need you know, a squad just to move along. that's just to, to help us, you know, get through the day. But, right. um, but you have to have everyone in the organization really willing to listen to those uh, interesting ideas. And that's not in everyone's um, uh, natural capacity. Uh, but, you know, you have to, you have to model it, you have to talk about its value. And, and, you know, I would just been so impressed with the things that people have done within the organization, like without being asked. I mean, I think um, you know, around January-ish, February, I, I looked back at my calendar. We were thinking this COVID thing is going to hit. It's going to get hard, hit harder than anybody imagined. I brought my leadership team into my office. I said, have not had foot surgery. So I was on this little bicycle, you know, for where you put your foot on. I'm going back and forth in front of this giant whiteboard. Um, and we're trying to put things into categories and just brainstorm, we're just putting everything up there on what it is that we thought we might need. And where were our gaps and what is it that we needed to do with documentation? And, and you know, if this got worse, what might need to happen? And so we had this loose framework and everyone knew that they, you know, could contribute to this. And I think that that flowed its way through the organization where People just, um, like over a weekend, we had put together, um, we'd had some new firewalls that we were going to implement and the equipment was there and we realized that we needed much uh, higher VPN capability that we had because we were going to have to pivot and we're like, hey, the firewalls will do that. And the, the security team literally came in on a weekend and configured those things and had them going between a Friday and a Monday. Like, didn't ask, it just did it and said, here it is, ready to go. And then had the, um, the, uh, the distributed IT professionals across the university testing it on that Monday to make sure it was ready to roll out to, to everybody on campus. I mean, I, I can come up with, you know, 103 stories like that about, about what happened, but it, it, it is all a part of, uh, you know, everyone can have a voice. Uh, everyone's idea is is valuable, and sometimes we'll put those things, you know, off to the side, and they'll they'll come back later. But um, you've got to have that situation where people feel comfortable talking about uh, what the possibilities might be, and also tell you when things are going horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> you know. Right. We, um, you're absolutely right. A lot of the things you've said, and one, one of the tactics that I've started years ago, and it actually, it was tough for me at times because, you know, when I have something that I want to say, I say it, um, is, is speaking last. When you bring your team in and you're asking for ideas, you're asking for thoughts and so forth. I've learned that 
if you speak first as the most senior leader around that table, at least a third of those will not say what they thought they were going to say when they entered the meeting. Because they're going to say, hey, the boss already made up his or her mind. They made a decision. So I'm just going to say something in support of that, mm-hmm. as opposed to letting them really contribute and share their own thoughts and ideas. And then, um, you know, sometimes change your mind mid-sentence. At the end of the day, hey, I was going to do X, but, you know, Jane said Z. And I think Z is a better idea. Let's go do that. And then it, I think it builds that culture yeah. of, of, of trust and understanding that we yeah. are in this it's together. Like the culture of team. Yep. Which you are better by bouncing those ideas. Back. Absolutely. Because you don't want everybody to be exactly the same. You don't want everybody to think the same. You don't want everybody the same background, the same experiences, because then you're narrow minded. One of the things, speaking of culture, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, that balance between, you know, being aware of cultures and when you walk in and those that you can be nudge and change and mold into different directions. Or, you know, as Peter Drucker used to say, one of my favorite quotes uh, from him was, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And you can be as tactful and as strategic as you want. And if it doesn't fit in that environment, if you have thousands of people that have been there for decades, that is not who they are. That's not what they believe in. That's not how they want to do business. Um, that takes a very, very long time. It's a very big wheel and, and it moves very slowly. Yeah. What are some of the tips and tricks kind of from you and your experience as to influencing and shaping culture and maybe nudging it off center a bit in, in a more desired direction? Right. I, I, I think in some ways, like, like one you kind of need to understand what the culture is that you walked into. And then um, two, you need to understand what people are unhappy with because the unhappy points are the movement points. So um, it, if people are, um, you, you know, I, I would say in the first six months, I'd get a lot of comments about like, oh my God, it's so much greater to have so much more communication about what's going on. Or, you know, people feel like they have access to leadership. They see you, you know, around the organization. Um, This is part of why I I maintain two offices because we have one that's sort of in the computing center, which is very far off of of campus and locked down. It's where, you know, the people who work on the ERP are and the security team and that sort of thing. And then we've got another group um, uh, that, you know, is pretty much our, our client support place, you know, where, where our consulting desk is going to be, where, where people go for help. And I said, you know, when I, I, I think I actually did this before I arrived on campus, I said, look, is there another office other than the CIO office in the computing center? Because the CIO is, is, is not an information technology asset that needs to be locked down. Uh, this, I need to be interacting with campus more and I need to be, you know, closer to where a little bit more of the, the action is so that I understand things. So um, our, part of this is, you know, we, we had an organization who was um, uh, hungry for greater communication from leaders within the organization. We had an organization that was hungry for um, the adoption of new practices like um, project management. Uh, They didn't so much get service management, but they got project management. But once project management happened and it worked, then, you know, service management was not far behind. (laughs) So if I'd started with service management, that totally, you know, would not have flown. It's a more Uh, abstract term, right? right. Yeah, it's it's a a little bit more abstract and, and challenging to do. But like, um, but then there are some things that I was completely unwilling to give on and the, and the, and the uh, culture was gonna have to move. And that was around diversity, equity and inclusion. And I made it clear through um, uh, that I expected my leadership team to be um, uh, taking advantage of uh, the resources from human resources or related to diversity, learning about that more, having conversations about it. Uh, uh, and it was very much in alignment with the growth of the, of the university on this, but I, I think that sometimes that tends to be a little bit more focused in the, in the academic ranks as opposed to the, to the business ranks, but um, this is something that I was completely unapologetic about. 
uh, and and uh, and now have people within the organization who are surpassing me in terms of their commitment to uh, to this. But part of that was just saying this is important, and then all the people who who had always thought it was important but wouldn't speak about it now have the dispensation and and the space to speak in ways that they had never done it before. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it's um, shifting culture is a very nuanced kind of thing and you can't do it by yourself. So, you know, the first thing you want to do is set expectations for your leadership team. Um, but and be respectful of the culture that is um, there, like the 40 year munchie party. Uh, right. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to look that up to see what, that, what that's all about. Well, people just bring, they just brought food into the okay. in, into the conference room and, and people would just be in there all day long eating snacks and nice. interacting with a very light work day, let's say that. <laughs> so, um, Sorry, I should have turned off notifications. Uh, no worries. Uh, on, on uh, but, you, you... Uh, but but yeah, it's 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 a little bit here. It's a lot there. It's uh, not not any moment in some places, but it, it it has to be a nuanced and thoughtful and intentional approach. You uh, you've hit up a lot of really important points, and you know, be the change you want to see, right? And right. it often it starts with one individual, and those who were trailblazers in the past over decades and centuries were often ridiculed at that time when they brought in a new idea or championed something that was off center or, or not part of that culture or those norms or those expectations of those communities and societies only to be in many cases, not always, but in many cases imitated and duplicated years or decades later saying, yeah, 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 we're doing that too. We were always on board. We knew that was the and right that thing. And that alive to say, I told you so. Correct, correct. So when it comes to innovation, right, and this is, that's, I guess, changing the way you do things, influencing culture, project versus service management, and so forth, all of those things can be innovative, all of those could be incremental, sometimes accidental even. Right. When you think of innovation, which I often think, think is one of the kind of founding cornerstone for our future, no matter what we do, right, nothing's the same as it was a year or three or five or 12 years ago. And, and 12 years from now, it's probably gonna look different than it does today. What are your thoughts of, of how does one become more intentional to infuse innovation in the work, in the culture, in, in what we do, right? Because everybody, we said earlier, right? Um, 24 hours are not enough. Right. How are you, what are some of your thoughts of how do we make that um, part of this experience where we broaden our horizons and we try new things and we fail and then we get up and dust ourselves off and we do it again, right? How do you do that? It, I think it's a great question because I think I've tried it in different ways over the course of my career. I mean, there, there are folks who set up innovation centers and you know I've done that in the past too. And while they are successful, they tend to demoralize and dishearten the people who are not in the innovation group uh, that, uh, oh, you know, my work, you know, is not innovative in any way because I'm not part of the innovation team. So over time, I began to believe that, you know, innovation is really something that we need to infuse and value and thread throughout everything that we do within the organization because I, innovation can happen in the tiniest of places and, and in the most unexpected of places. So um, uh, I would say kind of kind of the, the most challenging thing, I, you know, it's, um, I think about Freeman Rabowski, who's the president of, of UMPC saying, you know, ask good questions. You know, so a, as a leader, as our colleague, you know, what questions can you ask to get people out of their head? How do you, how do you get people out of, out of group think? And, and have those uh, lively conversations. How do you, as I've said, create that, that voice? How do you work against uh, culture? So, you know, one of the challenges I think in, in higher education IT is that we've been so used to working in, in MacGyver mode with, um, you know, chewed bubble gum and paper clips and band-aids that uh, when 
presented with an opportunity to spend money, we're still looking at the lowest budget way to accomplish something. And it's really, really hard to drag people out of that. You know, it, the, the first question you, you often get from uh, an organization that's just been skimmed from and skimmed from and skimmed from over time is what's the budget? I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> this is not how it works. You put together a plan and then we put together a budget associated with that plan. And, and that is the absolute hardest shift uh, towards um, innovation, I think that, that there can be. Another aspect of that is, um, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the first things that you'll see happen in a pandemic environment, we did it again. Uh, and I think almost every institution did it, every organization probably did, is that we stopped doing training and professional development. And this is the time when we need to be doing training and professional development, because this is the time when you most need to know about the interesting things that are happening elsewhere, that you lift your, 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 your nose and your eyes away from your belly button and look at what other people are doing. So um, those opportunities to look at different spaces, you know, I, I not only want to send folks to um, higher education, I, I'm actually going to participate a bit in a virtual conference, uh, which is uh, one of those just in a CIO Anywhere conferences. And it's also why I like to participate in the CIO chat, which I know uh, that you do as well from time to time, because while there are a bunch of higher education CIOs uh, in that chat, there are also people from industry. And some of the things they say, I'm like, ah, oh, well, that's clearly not something I'm dealing with, but what can I learn from this? Right. I might be able to apply. So, right. um, and I think there are times that we just need to lift out of our day-to-day -day environment. We did about two years ago, I brought in some folks to do a leadership event for, um, IT, the libraries and uh, communications and marketing at, at UB to just it, begin to develop the kinds of relationships that are sort of outside of the IT space that could also generate some interesting um, uh, innovation responses as well. Uh, there are ways that you can practice it and learn it and value it, uh, but it almost always uh, requires removing barriers um, pushing people to think about, you know, is there another way? Um, creating the safe spaces uh, for, for doing that and exposing people to new ideas uh, often. I don't know that that's everything, but that's certainly something that... Um, it's it's certainly a lot of uh, valuable advice and information. Um, you talked about many different challenges. And, and, you know, professional development is one of the ones you mentioned. Uh, I'm, honestly, I mean, my perspective, one man's point of view, um, I think many organizations in higher ed have not done it well, even before the pandemic. We could, especially, you know, considering we're institutions of higher learning. Right. Yeah. Like, our business model is education. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right? That's our business model. Um, but in your career, right? Well, it's closer to 20 or closer to 30 years. We'll let people guess. <laughs> um, and you have obviously started when you were seven. Yeah, thank um, you. appreciate that. <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you have experienced, whether they're biases or cultural or industry specific challenges, whether that industry is higher ed or whether that industry is IT or combination of both that you've experienced through your career that, um, you thought at some point in your career you left behind, but they keep surfacing. Like you see they them across different never, institutions. The, the gender bias is something that you never right. leave behind ever. Uh, I mean, even even now, it's it's interesting to sort of see how differently I'm treated as a as a woman who is a leader as opposed to a, a man who is a leader. I've been working with it for so long, though, that you know it it takes some probing questioning to sort of get to um, how it's different and, and how it is that, that I've sought to accommodate and, and deal with that. And I think in, in many ways, um, uh, when I first started out, I, I almost emulated a, a more masculine uh, 
response and you know it, it might take um, drinks and a lot of therapy to, to understand whether that was a, a, a me growing or whether that was you know a, a me responding to an environment kind of thing. But I, I have um, uh, certainly faced you know specific uh, bias, unconscious bias uh, in, in a field that is uh, dominated by white male, period. That's just the way it is in, in IT. Uh, so I have been working uh, and certainly because of my gender, I've worked a lot with women in technology and then realized that I'd really not done quite enough for people of color in technology. So uh, this is something that I'm very passionate uh, about um, changing. Um, throughout my um, career, I have had um, people who have thought enough of me and about me to really help me. Uh, and, and I can only imagine how idiotic and over the top and uh, <laughs> Oh, I may have come across to some. And I have sometimes given feedback to other leaders to say, yeah, I know you don't like X employee or Y employee or Z employee, but that person shows a lot of promise. And try to remember what you were like when you first started out. Have a little compassion and help them out. <laughs> because that's really only how I got to where I am because I, I had people who who saw something or were just kind <laughs> and, and gave me the kind of feedback and advice and, and I can only call it love uh, to, to help me grow as a leader. And, and you know I can name multiple people at every place that I've ever been and friends that have helped me through. And um, I, it was just something that was needed then, and I think it's needed every single day now. Um, uh, maybe less so than when I first started, maybe more so than when I first started. But I, I consider myself a person who learns every day, and I think that's sort of the, the, um, the, the context that you have to walk into leadership with. And having sort of arrived at where I am at this moment, um, I have tried very much to mentor and help others who need that no matter um, where they are in their, their path. And it's, it's really fascinating because, you know, I'll have people say that I said something at some time and you know, I don't remember that conversation. I don't. I but don't, they did. But they did. Yep. So, so you, you always have to be thoughtful. You always have to be on. You, you, um, uh, some of the things that that you share are, are things that really change people or something that that sticks so much that um, that it had an impact. And, and I think, you know, some of these people we have long relationships with and some people we have, you know, a five minute conversation with that changes their perspective. So um, you're, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, it's in today's world of quantifying everything, right? <laughs> Return on investment and numbers and value and data and analytics. How do you quantify leadership? It, it's, it's tough. Right. The two things that I've come across in, in my own experiences and reading um, a lot of literature in this space and speaking to a lot of great notable leaders is one, they make you feel a particular way, right? You may not know what they said or what they did every single time, but when you were around them, with them in their presence, they made you feel a particular way. Generally, often believing in yourself, confident, safe, empowered, supported, heard, and so forth. And two, how many leaders have they produced? And if you really start looking at your career, it's like, hey, this person started here. Now they're leading that. Now they're doing this. Now they're doing that. That's generally um, two, two ways. And there are obviously many more, but two that I've found that always kind of ring true. Mm -hmm. um, you've said a lot. And I think I could speak with with you and listen to you speak probably for days but to conclude this 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 episode of 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 the um of the podcast and you've already provided some of these things throughout some of your answers earlier but i would like to find a way to kind of put them all together 
What advice do you have to those who aspire to a role such as yours, to those who aspire to leadership, whether they're young girls um, or not, but what advice do you have to those who may look at you now and say, I am, you know, nine steps away. Like, how do I get there? Well, um, one is, is you need a squad. You know, I, I think Taylor Swift has a squad. Um, <laughs> so, so you need these people around you who support you and are there for you and, and cheerlead for you. And, and when I say that, it's, it's um, I mean, they have to be passionately behind uh, your leadership. At the same time, these are the same people that when you're open to it and when you want it will absolutely give you the most thoughtful and critical feed feedback that you can get because you want, if you're gonna grow, you need to hear the things that are not working. Uh, and uh, so you have to be open to that and, and you have to have people who are your cheerleaders as well. It, the last thing I would say is you, you kind of need to understand um, what helps you to be at your best. I was uh, very fortunate in, in my career to have uh, two opportunities to work with a, an executive coach, um, Christy Hedges, you can look her up. Uh, but um, one of the things that I learned about myself is that uh, I am not good unless I am centered. So if I get a little off kilter, if I get a little too stressed, if I get a little too wound up or a little too passionate, uh, I am not working at my leadership best. So um, uh, breathing, <laughs> reframing, uh, reflecting, these are the things that I need to practice doing so that I can um, uh, be at my best at, at any given moment. And you know, forgive myself when I, I, I don't do it properly, but uh, uh, just understanding what makes you tick and and, and uh, try to put yourself in the space where you personally can work in, in your best groove. Um, one of, as you said that, you know, when you get too passionate or too excited or too wound up or whatever it is, you haven't had enough sleep or, um, one of the anecdotes that, that stood out is from, from a video that I watched many, many years ago from this executive, a former CEO in the book publishing industry. And he had an executive coach who would come in for these kind of quarterly earnings calls. And she sat in the back of the room and looked at everyone. And at one point, it was an all day event. They were taking multiple breaks. And during one of the breaks, this is this gentleman uh, sharing the story. She walked up to him and she goes, what's wrong? He goes, what do you mean? Are you tired? He goes, no. Sick? No. Problems at home? No. Numbers look pretty good from what I can hear, right? Revenue and so forth and publishing and growth and sales and everything's looking good. He goes, yeah. She goes, so you're happy. And he goes, yes. She goes, and then her response was priceless. She goes, you might want to tell you to face that. <laughs> because he sat in there, he was not aware of that. He sat in that room, the CEO of this major multi-billion dollar company with this angry face and it was terrifying everybody around who was coming up to pitch their sales and quotas and achievements. He goes, I had no idea that that's how I was influencing and impacting the room and all these dozens of people around me. Um, so that's, that's really, really important um, to kind of end with. Um, Sharon, I appreciate you, not just today, um, your, your thoughts, your ideas, when we met at EduCause briefly and sat down in CIO Lounge and other places and your, your knowledge and, and experiences on Twitter. And thank you for your time um, that you spent with me today. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to us continue, continuing this conversation at a later date. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. And, and you know, I think a lot of you and, uh, and look forward to the, to the other podcasts that you do with, with others. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who are either listening or watching this. And until next time, and don't forget, no matter what you want to achieve in life, whatever greatness is for you, there are no shortcuts. It always takes time, effort, and energy. And it's on you to do what needs to be done in order for you and those with you to get there. Have a wonderful day.